So I am a teacher. All I ever wanted to be was a teacher. I grew up in the city of Waterbury. You know, I was that kid that lined up dolls, you know, played school, erased the chalkboard, passed out papers. And what I realized was that no one in my family had ever gone to college, so I didn't know what I needed to do to pursue this dream of, coming, of becoming a teacher. So I met some amazing people in my life who came in and out of my life and invested in me. But at that same time, life was just happening. I grew up in the largest public housing project in the city. My mother struggled with addiction for the greater part of my life. My grandmother raised my brother and I. I, like my mother and my grandmother, became a teenage mom, gave birth to my daughter when I was 17, and really didn't know what the future looked like or how to even begin to imagine that. But I did it, and it worked. I went to community college, then went on and got a bachelor's degree, then a master's degree, and then a six-year degree, and went back to the community that I love to teach. And what I realized was that many of my students were in the same situation that I had just navigated my, my way out of. But I also realized that I didn't do it alone. And I was uniquely positioned to be able to stand in intercession for them until they could stand for themselves. I had this acute idea that hopelessness was a feeling long before it was an action. And if I could just get them to believe and see something bigger than themselves, then we could do some amazing things. And that's just what happened. And I was minding my business, in my classroom, doing amazing things, me and my kids. And people started to take notice, not because I wanted them to, but really, I guess, character is defined by what you do when nobody's watching. And nobody was watching me and my kids, and we just started to shine in all of these different areas. And as a result of that, I became the Waterbury Teacher of the Year, the Connecticut Teacher of the Year, and then ultimately the 2016 National Teacher of the Year. And this is where the intersectionality happens, because very little of what I just said to you, it's amazing, in the last three years I've probably said that little intro 3,000 times, but in the last 30 years, if I said it four times, you know, because I never said it. But it wasn't until I was thrust into the spotlight and into this position, and I realized that there are so many people that could benefit, you know, that could build their agency by just hearing that we share this in common, who could begin to believe in something bigger if they know that this is only part of the journey and there is another side. So I began to share that narrative as a way to empower other people to begin to do the same. I never imagined that it would lead me to this idea that I would be a congresswoman or a representative. 358 days ago, a series of unfortunate events happened and I decided I'm gonna run for Congress. It hasn't even been a year yet since I first had the thought and said this is what I'm gonna do. And people said, there's no way you're gonna do this. You don't have the network, you don't have the money, you can't figure it out. And I said, but I'm affected by everything that happens in this country. And in my mind, I had this one simple concept. I said, if Congress starts to look like us, which I thought was a pretty um, passive statement, you know, it wasn't anything that anybody would take issue with, and it was a gaslight in this state. What I said was, if Congress starts to look like us. And in my mind, this was the modern day adaptation of we the people. Us, to me, was community. It was everybody who occupies space, who lives in this country, who was invested in their communities, who lives, works, plays, worships. But what people heard when I said that is that I wanted a Congress full of black women. Wouldn't have been bad, but that's not what I said. <laughs> And what I embarked on was this journey that was so completely foreign to me because as an educator, as the national teacher of the year, I walked into a room and people loved me. I was embraced. Now all of a sudden, I walked into a room with a letter behind my name that identified with the party and there were all of these judgments affiliated and associated with me. And most of them were wrong. Because before you got to the title of candidate for Congress, I was mother, sister, friend, teacher, Christian, community uh, person, all of these things. So this idea that this one title, black woman, would align me exclusively to one group of people is so incredibly flawed. And I think that unless and until we begin to expand the idea of what this looks like and who gets to participate, we have a problem. I was told, 
Like I said, you've never done this before. You don't have the experience. And I says, okay, well, what type of experience do you need to represent people? I'm a people, that's gotta count for something. You know, people said, well, typically, typically is a word that I have lost favor with. Because typically, you had to have had some legislative experience. Typically, you had to have a law degree or have practiced law. Typically, you had to have a political network and the ability to fundraise. Typically, all of these things, I cannot tell you how many times I heard the word typically. If I used the word typically as a drinking game, I would have been drunk on the floor every day. Because typically, everything that they told me I had to do, I never did. I didn't have the ability or capacity to do, and that wasn't the community that I operated in. So in my mind, I was saying if we have a system where all of the rules assigned and associated with this system don't identify with me and my life experiences, then by default, I am excluded. I don't get to play, I don't get to participate. My only role is to sit on the sidelines. And I said, I reject that. I asked, is it a rule or a law? And I knew the answer because I'm a history teacher. So I knew that if I chose to, I could jump in. And I said, that's fine, we'll figure it out. I launched a campaign that really, I thought about as a constituent, as a voter, what worked for me? What are the types of things that worked for me? I said, I'm good at people. Relationships have to matter, that has to mean something. I value all groups of people, that has to mean something. But I had this unwavering commitment to this idea of in a truly representative democracy, Every single person in every single room would be able to find someone on the floor of Congress that they could associate with and identify with. Doesn't mean all of those people are going to be exactly the same. We need people at every end of the spectrum because that's perspective. That, those are all the layers. Those are all of the conversations that are already happening in our communities. So if you are saying to me, that I don't get to participate in that conversation, that means that the solutions that you are working on will never include me. I was told, and, and I cringe every time I hear the statement, that I am the first African American woman to ever represent the state of Connecticut in Congress. First of all, that's amazing, but it's also shameful it's demeaning and it's devaluing and it is not representative of the state that I grew up in and the state that, in the community that I love. Because it says, in all of the years of our democracy, we've never expanded that to welcome in and include other people in the state of Connecticut. And people said to me, those same people who said, well, this is identity politics, you're a black woman, you could only you will only be able to identify with black women or women from urban communities or educators, assigning ownership to the only people that I could have a conversation with. I said, well, does that mean that in all of the years of white male leadership on my behalf, none of those people could speak adequately or appropriately for me? Because this is what that conversation says, and it's flawed. And what I have been saying to people and what I remind people, because I still do not identify as a politician. When I came here, I said, I'm on a college campus. This is amazing. What I think we need to do is we have to start redefining the rules of what this looks like. Our rules for engagement don't work. We have to evolve and progress and change with the times. When the term, we the people, was first pinned to paper, 1776, there's a reasonable expectation that the people in that community are very different than the people in this community. And that's okay. That's okay. Our diversity is our strength. Our unity is our power. This idea that we all have to be the same, sound the same, look the same to understand each other does not work. Trust me, you don't want the life that I had. But the life that I had has uniquely positioned me to open the door of empathy, of understanding, of agency, of ad advocacy, and all of that is important. When we begin to diminish or devalue or ask other people to diminish or devalue any part of who they are in order to give credence to someone else's conversation, then we've missed the mark. By default, 
When we allow ourselves to shine, we give other people permission to do the same. Because I trust me, there is somebody who shares your experiences, who has walked in your shoes, who thinks that they are the only one. Even though I knew that I wasn't the only 17-year-old who had ever gotten pregnant and dropped out of high school and went back to school, I know that somebody else needed to hear me say that from a national platform on a national stage that, so that they could know that you two are okay. We cannot continue to surrender the power that is in our voice because someone out there does not have a voice and they are waiting for you and for you and for you and for you to use your voice and use your courage and use your strength to give power to their voice until they can do it for themselves. I never imagined 15 years ago that I would be celebrated at the height of my profession or 358 days ago that I would be standing on the floor of Congress voting on some of the most important legislation that will impact our future. But the times have found me. The times have found me and there is something, there is a message that only I have, something that only I can say, but every single person has their own unique message and in a representative democracy, all of those messages matter. All of those messages matter. Even the minority opinion matters. Because if that's not considered, then we can't ever legislate appropriately. We can't, if we can't consider this in rooms and on the floor of Congress and in our legislative and government bodies, then how is it that what comes out, that the solutions that emerge will adequately and appropriately address people in all communities? They can't. They can't. So I ask you, just to rethink what this means to me, to you. Everybody in your community, everybody on this campus, your generation has really been, been deemed the disruptors. You're changing the rules. You're changing the way this looks. People think that's gonna get us in trouble, but I welcome it because it's good trouble and there's nothing wrong with that. We have to look at this as a participation sport. I was floored when I went to the Committee on Education and Labor and was searching for a teacher that I could just find community with and form some types of alliances with and realize it's just me. How are we making policy about education and the impact that it'll have on the outcomes for our kids when we don't even have the people who are on the ground faced with those decisions who know what this looks like by the time it gets to them in the classroom at the same time? How is it possible that we can have conversations about education? And I'll tell you how it's possible because we have convinced people that you're not ready for this. We'll tell you when it's your turn. You haven't been prepared. You don't have the experience. How is it that we can have a committee on health and human services that does not include a healthcare professional? Because someone has convinced them that it's not your turn. You're not ready. You don't have the experience. The wonderful thing about our democracy, and this is what I love about this country, this is why I dedicated my career to teaching civics and government and social studies, is that it works. It works. Our government works. I know what happens when it works correctly. I am what happens when it works correctly. That people don't wait until they are directly affected by the problem, but they work on a solution because it's right. And they lend their agency and their voice to other people who don't have that yet, and we work together, and we rise by lifting others, and we build each other up. That's what good government looks like. And unless and, until we, unless and until we play by those rules, it is to our peril. So in my mind, I imagine this place where you have different people from backgrounds, from perspectives, from socioeconomic statuses and, and genders and coming together, looking at one problem and bringing all of these unique perspectives to that problem so that we, we can move forward to a solution. This is what I'm seeing now. And I am so incredibly humbled to be a part of that because this is how it's supposed to work. This is what it's supposed to look like. So when I made that statement and got all that pushback from this idea, if Congress starts to look like us, I didn't retreat from it. I leaned into it because I said, yeah, that's what I said. And even if you heard it differently, the answer to 
the challenge of somebody hearing something differently than what you said is not to retreat. It's to stand and help them understand. And we've lost sight of that. We cannot run away when it gets hard. Life is hard. We cannot run away when it gets tricky. Life is tricky. What we can do is stand and help people understand. Open up the doors of apathy and empathy and say, this is how I feel when you take that action. Or even if it's not how you feel, have you ever considered how someone else might feel? That's our government. That's our democracy. And that is not assigned to one party, to one platform, to one group. If you truly understand American history, that belongs to you. We the people is you, is me, is us. And the government is ours to keep. Thank you.